Welcome back. It's season two of How the F*** Do You Do That? I'm Kevin. I'm here and you're there. And I have missed hanging out with you. I hope this 30 minutes makes your walk or dishes or puzzle a little brighter today. My daughter can't believe how many new listeners have joined us during the break. Thank you for rating and subscribing and sharing the show with people you think might enjoy it. Okay, a moment with Q, the elephant in the room. Um, how have you been? I've been trying not to stop and think, trying to do that like it's my job. I've actually been thinking about this a lot during the summer break. While I've been hanging out with the staff of How the F*** Do You Do That on our yacht in the Maldives, we've been talking about how for the last six months, whether we still have jobs or not, we've all been surviving like it's our job. It's a gift, we say to each other in our most positive moments. It's maybe a gift to have this connection with the majority of humanity that's gone before us. Survival isn't a given. All of our entitled foundations are subject to erosion, and it's just chance that we were born in a time where it seemed unlikely. I don't know about you, but I've experienced a real distillation in my world, and I'm so grateful for the clarity. There are crystal clear edges around the people and the places and the art that I love and miss. Okay, end of elephant talk. Let's talk about some jobs. I have some episodes coming up with exciting folks, including illuminating time with a translator who lives on an island paradise and a live Foley artist. But to kick off season two, let's visit with someone whose job is sometimes literally calm during the storm. This was recorded live in a special broadcast for Chicago Radio Theater. Places, please. It's Rochelle Harrington Callan. Hey, you're listening to Chicago Radio Theater, and this is a special live edition of the podcast, How the F*** Do You Do That? A brilliant interview show about how jobs change and reveal our fellow humans. Hey, it's Kevin. I've missed you. Wherever this finds you, I hope you and your loved ones are safe and well during the strange times. I'm honored to be joined today by theater stage manager, Rochelle Harrington Callan. Do you know what a stage manager does? A stage manager is so many skill sets rolled into one position. A good stage manager makes all the difference in the flow of a rehearsal, in the efficient progress of what we call tech, which is the crunch time when we move into the theater and add in all the design elements, and in maintaining the artistic integrity of the run of a show. Think of this person as the bus driver for so many parts of the process of making and presenting a play. If you're riding a bus, eight hours a day, six days a week for a few weeks. Then you ride the bus 12 hours a day for a week or more, and then for two hours, eight times a week for a couple months, you'd like someone, a bus driver, who does more than tick the boxes of technically getting you from A to B. If you were on a bus that much, you'd start to really appreciate the nuances of your bus driver's skills and, well, their company, too. Rochelle Harrington Callan is one of my favorite stage managers I've worked with as a director, and I'm honored that she's making my show look fancy by talking with me today. Hey, Rochelle. Hey. Thanks for doing this. Good to be here. Um, hey, I just did that bus driver analogy. Is that a good analogy? Uh, I love it. I have often, when I'm describing it to people who have never, who literally have no idea what I do, I sometimes describe it as air traffic controller only because Part of my job is bringing in all of the information from the various departments and then redistributing it to everybody who needs to know that information. Uh, so there's kind of, I feel like there's more pieces and parts to an air traffic controller than a linear bus ride. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, when did you start stage managing? Honestly, in high school, I uh, auditioned for a show in high school, which I never should have been doing in my life, and I have no <laughs> desire to ever want to do anymore. But uh, the head of the theater department, uh, Kurt Kindy, said, you know, 
after my audition, you know, you'd be a good stage manager, which <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, great. Um, but I've literally been doing it since I was like 16. What, um, what would you say is your favorite thing about the job? Uh, definitely the people. Um, theater people are some of the warmest, kindest, and most open and honest people you'll ever meet in your life. Uh, there's occasionally a, di a difficult personality or two, like there would be with any job, but sure. uh, definitely the people. Um, and in general, I just love, I've loved theater in general since I was, well, my mom was taking me to shows when I was, you know, seven, eight years old. Mm -hmm. uh, I just love seeing all of the technical aspects of it come together. Uh, I'm one of those people who, who like a beautiful musical passage in Bridges of Madison County will actually make me cry just because I love music that much. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, I just, I love all of the art of it and the aspects of it, uh, but the people are really the important thing. And you know, the great thing about theater is if you end up working with some people who are kind of jerks at some point, you're only going to do it for like six to eight weeks, probably. <laughs> Max. <laughs> Max. Um, what would you say is your least favorite part of the job? Oh, uh, dealing with, well, I would say specifically, if a theater expects me to deal with a difficult actor's issues, uh, say mm. an actor is consistently being late or something, you know, they're members of my union as well. And that shouldn't, it should be my job to say that it's happening, but it shouldn't be my job to correct the issue. Um, I can see where that would be really uncomfortable. What is that, what is that conversation like with, a, would it be a producer that is asking or expecting you to kind of do something outside the scope of your job? Yeah, last time I had it happen, it was uh, a director who is very dear to me, but he was also management at the theater that we were working at. Good morning. Yeah, and uh, he just said, I need you to address this issue because uh, next time I will, and I need somebody to have stepped in before me. And I sort of thought at the moment, well, I'm pretty sure that's your job and not mine, <laughs> but okay. And I did address it and it didn't go well. And the actor stormed out of rehearsal and uh, it, we got through it eventually. Uh, but that actually, that whole process was fraught with challenge. <laughs> I'm sorry. What, uh, makes a, what makes a great process for you? I have had so many great processes, especially at the theater where we have both worked together. Um, collaboration, when uh, directors appreciate the work that their actors are doing and really like listen to them and work with them and actors who are you know open to taking direction and notes and stuff um i think a good script has a lot to do with it but you know <laughs> sure but it doesn't it doesn't have to be a good script i have done some really wonderful like enjoyable processes on a script that was like well you know Maybe this isn't going to Broadway anytime soon, but <laughs> we are wonderful people and we're having a very good time doing it. That's great. Um, I want to, so it was a, a couple years ago when you were 16 and you, you first stage managed. Can you <laughs> think back to the person you were before you started doing this as your job? I wonder how you feel like doing your job has changed you. Um, I was a lot more timid then. Uh, I was very small voiced and uh, very shy. And I think just the process of having done a hundred and some odd shows, uh, probably nearing 200 right now, actually, uh, you grow a lot and you learn a lot. And I've worked with some really amazing people who taught me a lot. And I've worked with some very difficult people who taught me to be a lot stronger than I thought I was and uh, taught me to listen better and communicate better. Um, I have a sort of a follow-up question for that, but I realize I, I think it would be good to do some, some context for folks who really might not have a, have a sense of the mechanics of what you do. Can I be 
um, can I be like a cousin at a family reunion and ask you a couple questions about what you do? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so Rochelle, you, now you, um, what, do you tell them where to go? What do you do? <laughs> Um, sometimes I remind them where to go, but the director is the one who tells them where to go. Um, I coordinate all of the information regarding a play. So uh, a week before the show starts, uh, I'm reading the script. I'm making a prop plot of all the things that they might handle in the show. I make a sound plot of all the sound cues you might hear in the show. Uh, I make note of scenic elements. I measure a ground pan plan, which is a scale ma uh, rendering of what the set will be, and we tape it out. Then we start rehearsals, and uh, I essentially run the rehearsals. Um, the direct I am the director's right-hand person during rehearsals. Uh, I make sure we take breaks when we're supposed to take breaks. I write down where the actors are supposed to go and erase and rewrite it every single time that it changes, and it does change on a daily basis. Um, I do rehearsal reports after every rehearsal. Uh, when we get into teching the show, which is where we add all of the scenic and lighting and sound and costume elements, um, I run that. I call the cues, which actually, uh, I found it surprising when I worked with an, a female equity actor several years ago who had no idea that the stage managers called the cues. <laughs> yeah, I, I was baffled. I'm like, okay, I know you're like in your early 20s, but how did you get your equity card and not know what I do? So calling the cues <laughs> is uh, essentially, if you see a sound cue or, or if you see a light cue or hear a sound cue or a scenic move happen on stage, somebody like me has been sitting in the booth and, and announcing when it's about to happen and then asking for it to happen by saying go. Uh, after the show, I write the performance reports and give notes on anything that might've gone right or wrong in the show to either the actors or the crew. Um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> well, that's a lot. So you go to all the shows? <laughs> yes, yes. I go to all the shows. I watch every detail of what happens and make notes on it. Um, and then chat with the actors afterwards, see if they had any concerns or needs in the show, uh, give any notes on anything that might have gone right or wrong, uh, anything that was especially wonderful that particular evening, like a little nuance that they had discovered, or, you know, if they skip several lines or an entire scene of a play, which I have had happen before. Um, can I, I'm going to spare us all and, and drop the cousin at the reunion dialect, <laughs> but now what if I am, tell me, tell me what that sounds like. I'll pretend um, I'm the actor backstage. I'm just fascinated in the language. So um, let's, let's pretend you're watching the show and I did something that was within the bounds of the script and the production, but it was especially good tonight. What do you, what do you think when you, when you see it happen during the show, when you notice it, what do you, how do you process it? Uh, I would go, wow, that, that was like really uh, insightful or special, or there was something about that one moment tonight. And I would approach them after the show and say, hey, you know, I really loved what you did with that one moment tonight. Uh, it was really moving for me. And uh, I think the director would be really proud to see that happen again. Oh, that's great. Well, well said. <laughs> um, and then what if, um, what if I add lines? What no. if I do something that, that I, I really go off script and I add some lines? Not for a, you know, not because... Uh, something like a door didn't open or somebody's clothes ripped, but like I just add lines in there. How do you address something like that? Uh, I would say, uh, hey, you know, that that's not what the playwright, <laughs> it's not what the playwright put in the play. Uh, it, it was an interesting choice, but perhaps we should actually do what was directed and written. Um, do, you, do you feel like when you address things like that because stuff like this happens i'm assuming yes sure i've course. certainly seen it um <laughs> and what kind of responses do you get from that what are the what are the range of responses it totally varies uh i will say recently i had a female actor who was like well it's a long run and that's just what i need to do for my own performance during this long run and i was like oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Um, and does that start to get into the not your committee anymore? <laughs> um, well, yes. I mean, uh, I would probably put into a private email between uh, the director of the show and or somebody else who could be addressing that. You know, so this is happening and I've tried addressing it and they seem resistant to it. And are you okay with this change? <laughs> could you give me a little backup here? Great. Um, <clears throat> tell me about when, um, how about at the beginning of the process, when you first meet some of the people that you're going to be working with for a while, when you first meet the director or when you first meet the cast, what kinds of things are going through your mind as you take in each person? Sure. Um, directors are almost universally overjoyed to be working on a show, and they're so excited and so <laughs> gung-ho and so ready to go. I can only think of one difficult director I've worked with in my life, and that was also the producing artistic director of said theater, hmm. uh, who no longer has their job because they were so obnoxious. Hmm. Um, but directors are so generally like, so excited to start on the project and uh, remain so throughout the process. I find with actors, I like to sit back a little bit and watch them. Everybody's always super excited for the first rehearsal, the mm -hmm. first day of school. Everybody's like super nice and in best behavior. Um, but as you're going through the first few days, you start to see whatever their true personality might be emerge. You can start to see if there's gonna be friction between one or two people in the cast. Mm -hmm. um, uh, or if anybody has any like, you know, personality quirks that might need tending to or a little bit of extra care and discussion. Um, but in general, we're all just so happy to have work. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when we get back to work, I think everybody is going to be amazingly kind and nice. Uh, we have joked about the first day of rehearsal when we finally get to go back to work. We're just going to cry and hug. Yeah, the whole time. <laughs> yep. Eight hours. So I'll, uh, that's mm -hmm. what my daily event schedule will be. It's like a <laughs> 10 to 11.30 a.m. cry and hug. 10-minute mm -hmm. break. <laughs> um, so let's, let's pretend you're watching something in rehearsal. What, as you're watching a scene, it, it's hard to ask this question without a specific thing in mind, but think of a particular process mm -hmm. um, that, that, you, that you enjoyed. And um, uh, you're you're watching the way the director is working on a scene um, with, with the actors. You're, you're watching something sort of get built. Mm -hmm. um, what kinds of things are you tracking in your mind as you were you're observing that? And if I if I watch you, you've got you've got a, a large notebook with a number of different places that you're writing things down. What kinds of things are you thinking in your mind as you're observing a scene being built? Uh, my prompt book is what we call my big notebook, uh, has three columns on the right hand side. The first column is for cues, which sometimes I have during rehearsal, like sound cues and things that I can play. Uh, eventually, light cues will get added in there and possibly automation cues if we have automation or the scenery moves. Um, the second column is a little tiny column, and I just call it notes. And that's for anything I hear the director say about what he or she intends, or they, intend for the character to feel or not feel. I've had um, directors specifically request uh, performers in very challenging scenes to not cry because if they cry, the audience won't. Mm -hmm. And we want the audience to feel it and not necessarily the human on stage to express it for them. Uh, so I, I write down anything like that that I want to be watching for during the performance process uh, in order to maintain what the director intended. And then the third column is just who goes where, when, and like little diagrams of if, you know, it's a big cast show, little diagrams of who should be in what position at the top of the page. Now, it seems like on a day-to-day -day basis as a scene is being built and run, that there would be lots of changes. Um, are you just constantly changing what you've what you've written down as the thing is changing in front of you? Yeah, absolutely. If it's a new play, uh, I've started using 
two pages. So essentially I can take out that page with all the notes and blocking and stuff and just replace it with an entirely fresh page once it gets <laughs> too tattered and worn. But that's also because if it's a new play, sometimes the script side, you know, with all of the text and dialogue and stuff, right. uh, gets replaced on a daily basis. Sometimes 20 or 30 pages get replaced on a daily basis. So, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I go through a lot of eraser um, <laughs> and I keep a lot of mechanical pencils at hand. And uh, I always feel it's a good day when I've gone through more eraser than pencil, because that means uh, people are getting closer and closer to getting all their lines right. And I'm not having to make as many notes. I'm getting to erase notes from my script. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, blocking and staging, as you well know, uh, changes right up until opening. So Yeah, it does. Um... How would you say your job is with you when you're not at work? Uh, I think my job is with me a lot. I haven't had a theater nightmare since, well, I think I had one like between March 17th and now, but um, it stays with me. Uh, it's uh, it, generally a stage manager's day is very long. Um, people always joke about hating the 10 out of 12s because they're such long days, and that's why we rehearse 10 out of 12 hours in a day. But usually, a stage manager's day is longer than a 10 out of 12 to begin with during the regular rehearsal process. So, mm. uh, so it stays with me. Um, there's, you know, if there are uh, struggles going on in the rehearsal hall, conflict between actors, it's hard to forget that and let it go. But uh, I find that going home and after I finish my rehearsal or performance report, uh, watching TV or reading or just snuggling a cat on the sofa while checking Facebook is very helpful. Great. That was going to be another question. What do you do to, what, what do you like to do at the end of a day? Um, that's great. Um, how many, do you have one cat, more cats? We have three cats right now. Okay. And you, um, when you work away from home, does A or all cat go with you? Uh, last summer, one of the cats came to visit me because my husband went to Europe for a week to perform with his sea shanty vocal group. And so she came to stay with me for about eight weeks and out of my five, six month contract. And it was fantastic because I missed them so much all of my previous years there mm. uh, that it was so wonderful to have her like waiting for me in my room at the end of the day and curled up on my lap purring while I wrote my performance report. Like <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. Oh. Um, can you share with me um, some stories of unusual goings on in your work? One of the yes. things I know we all love about theater is really anything could happen because it's really live and they're real people <laughs> in front of a real audience. Tell me some of uh, a favorite story or two of unusual things that have happened in rehearsal or a show. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to mention the shows because they don't portray anybody in a negative light. Uh, last summer on the closing day of Ghost, the door, which was very critical to the action of the show because, you know, it's Ghost. So there's a guy who is a ghost now because he's been shot. Uh, mm -hmm. the whole effect was him passing through the apartment door and there were sound cues and light cues and everything that went with that. Well, on the closing day of the show, the door fell off the set. <laughs> Just boom, fell off the set. And my lovely assistant stage manager, who is a dear friend, uh, came out and like held it and like looked upstage and looked downstage and said, what do you want me to do? And so I was like, I don't know. I have to keep calling cues. You decide. Uh, so she just leaned it up against the set and then our production manager and I think technical director or uh, manager on duty came and uh, we pretended that they were the building supervisor and they got it rehung. It was one of those sliding doors as opposed to a, an opening and closing arching door. Mm -hmm. uh, so they got it rehung on the set. But uh, I think my favorite story still that I have in my career to date was uh, you and I worked together, as we discussed earlier, uh, during the summer of wet at a certain summer stock theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, one night during uh, Peter and the Starcatcher at this theater, uh, we lost power. And uh, fortunately, it's, uh, it's Peter and the Starcatcher is a fairly complex show with tons of light cues and sound cues. 
uh, and uh, a man in a mermaid costume that lights up with microfilament lights. And uh, so the good thing was we lost power after the last, next to last, I should say, sound cue in the show. All of the songs and music had passed. So the fact that we lost microphones and uh, Clearcom headset communication wasn't a huge deal. Uh, and at first, everything just went dark, like the stage lights went out and nothing, you know, it was just pitch black. <laughs> and the gentleman playing the mermaid was wearing his microfilament costume. And uh, thank God it was battery operated. So he was the most beautiful, radiant thing on stage. And it was perfect. <laughs> and God loved that cast. Nobody even like batted an eyelash. Like they didn't stop saying words. They didn't stop doing their movement. They just kept going. And I was like, okay. And then the generator kicked on, which uh, gave us house lights at full and work lights on stage. So we didn't have any more of our beautiful, beautiful light cues. And uh, unfortunately there was one sound cue left in the show. And uh, it was the sound of a roaring crocodile that uh, it, it essentially resolves the action of the show. It causes the bad guys to go away and the good guys win the day and life mm -hmm. is beautiful. But if they don't hear that roaring crocodile, then what are they gonna do? So I'm standing in my very dark booth with my headset that doesn't work and a walkie talkie that does. And uh, Cody, our production manager was up there with me for a little while and then he had gone backstage and, and he was asking me, do you wanna stop the show? Do you wanna stop the show? I'm like, no, they seem to be doing really well on their own. But uh, you know, it's pouring rain and there's horrible thunder and lightning and uh, the audience is all lit up. And one of my actor friends was in visiting, seeing the show and sitting on the balcony. And I was like, well, I guess I'm going to do what I have to do at this point and I'm going to. And then I put on my little headset because the crocodile in the show had um, red eyes and I happened to have a little uh, headlamp that uh -huh. could, could glow two red eyes. And I got down on my hands and knees and I crawled out on the balcony and Catherine Duffy was looking at me like, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> and I, at the right moment in the show, I roared my little heart out. Wow. And I remember the actors all slowly turning and looking up at the balcony and seeing me and like, the look of shock on their faces was actually appropriate because the people who were supposed to be shocked were supposed to look shocked at that moment. Mm -hmm. And then they just ran off stage like they were supposed to. And I crawled back to the booth. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And then we all held flashlights to let the audience get up to uh, the parking lot. So like all of the cast and crew and everybody just grabbed flashlights because there was absolutely no light in the upper parking. So nobody could see, so we got them all out safely. Um, I just want to say, I think that's a really great metaphor <laughs> for the power of theater and the power of human beings to work together to make the best of a really difficult situation and turn it into a wonderful and really memorable situation. I think yeah. that's so great. Hey, Rochelle, I've, um, I'm so grateful that you spent this time with me today. Um, the last thing I, I wondered if, if I could get you to do is to um, call the cue for the music at the end. Could, could you just, for folks who don't know, um, could you explain like what the format of a cue is when you're, when you're talking on, on headset to operators or things like that? Sure, absolutely. Um, so in general, we have warning, standby, and go. I almost never give warnings unless uh, crew might be far away from where they need to be and might need 30 seconds, two minutes, or whatever to get there. So I might call uh, warning scene shift four, and they would know what that meant, and uh, that would give them the appropriate time they needed. But mostly I just call standbys and goes. So you would hear shortly before the cue sequence was supposed to happen, something akin to standby lights 47 through 85, sound 12 through 18. And then uh, depending on the situation you're working in, if it's an, uh, a union stagehand house, nobody might respond. If you're, <laughs> if you're crew, I learned that the hard way. If you're crew, <laughs> oh no, really, 
it was embarrassing. Uh, if your crew is all interns, they've been trained by colleges to respond. So they will respond by saying lights, sound, fly, whatever their uh, spot one, spot two, whatever their position is. And then when we get close to the sequence, uh, depending on how complicated it is, it would sound something like lights 41, go. Lights nice. 42 and sound 18, go. <laughs> okay, well, my sound cue in Q Lab here is Q, it's my, my cue number two. Standby sound two. Standing by. Sound two, go. Listeners, that was so fun. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for tuning in again. Coming soon, the first proper episode of the season with a magical Mallorcan translator. Original music for the show is once again by Andy Hansen. If you'd like to learn more about other projects, including Chicago Radio Theater, visit kevinchristopherfox.com. One of the live shows is still up there for your listening pleasure. It's called Trifles, and it's a live audio production of a classic one-act mystery by Pulitzer Prize winner Susan Glassbell, featuring a cast of amazing Chicago theater actors, original music, and live Foley sound. It's 30 minutes of audio bliss to tide you over till the next episode. Cheers, everyone. I gotta go run. (laughs) ¶¶